Chris Mikowski from Emerging Civil War, delighted to have you with, you with us tonight for a discussion about the surrenders at the end of the war. And I am joined by an esteemed panel of smart people, which is always a fun, uh, fun time. Uh, let me go from my screen. I'm going to go from left to right. Uh, Emerging Civil War's chief historian, Chris Kolakowski, my great Polish brother. He is with the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. And when he's not writing about India and Burma and some fantastic stuff with World War II, uh, just a fantastic Civil War historian as well. Uh, next to him, sporting a fantastic Fort Sumter hat, um, since we're talking about the end of the war, there's actually a cool Fort Sumter story we can talk about tonight. Uh, Doug Ullman, uh, formerly with the American Battlefield Trust, uh, contributor to Emerging Civil War, all around smart guy. He's got some fantastic videos on the Trust website. You can see a lot of Doug, um, so we're delighted to have him here with us tonight. And then finally, last but not least, my partner in crime, Chris White with the American Battlefield Trust, the education manager, former chief historian here at Emerging Civil War and co-founder of Emerging Emerging Civil War, and uh, one of my frequent collaborators and uh, co-writer. So glad to have all three of you with us tonight. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for having us. So I asked uh, Mr. White if he'd like to kind of get us to the end of the war. I don't think he's going to start with uh, Fort Sumter, but maybe you kind of set the table for us for the surrenders. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's helpful to, to jump back to uh, March of 1865, and I'll, I'll throw up some, some maps here in a moment or two. Uh, but, you know, March of 1865 is, is really the end game for uh, both armies, uh, Northern and Confederate. Uh, what, what you're looking at is um, two armies that are on the ropes when you're talking about the Confederacy. There are a lot of armies that, that are still in the field or, or military divisions, but the two primary or principles that we'll talk about tonight are led by Robert E. Lee, um, and Joseph Johnston. Uh, Lee's army had been, you know, since June of 1864, um, ensconced around Petersburg and Richmond, Virginia. It is a it's a, a, it's a prolonged siege of about nine and a half months. It'll end up becoming 292 days, the longest siege in American military history. Um, so as you're, you're looking at March of 1865, Lee's army is strung out for about 30 miles uh, around Petersburg, and then lines run north or, uh, across the Appomattox River, north towards Richmond. Um, so you have this long extended Confederate line. Lee is holding on by a, a hair, you know, trying to defend Petersburg and Richmond and trying to keep its lines of supplies open. Um, since June, uh, Ulysses S. Grant and his army group has been around uh, Petersburg and Richmond, slowly moving to the west um, and to the south and then to the west. And eventually he is going to uh, try to break Robert E. Lee's lines open. Um, and what's going to help, help him to do this is going to be the fact that uh, Grant earlier had given up the Union Army of the Potomac's Cavalry, sent it out to the west into the Shenandoah Valley under Philip Sheridan, turns into uh, an army group out there. And um, what ends up happening is these Cav come back to the Eastern Theater, as we would call it, around Petersburg. And now Grant truly has a mobile strike force. He'll send this mobile strike force out west towards Dinwiddie Courthouse. And then on April 1st of 1865, uh, the Battle of Five Forks will be a bridge too far for the Confederates. And about 10,000 Confederates are either captured or run off the field uh, by elements of the Union Fifth Army Corps, as well as Sheridan's Cavalry. And it's going to be that straw that breaks the camel's back uh, around Petersburg. The next day, uh, General Grant is going to order an assault uh, along the Petersburg lines, um, and it'll be a general assault, which will lead a, to a breakthrough near a place called Pamplin Park today. Um, the American Battlefield Trust has preserved a lot of land at Petersburg, um, and this will be one of the great last assaults of the American Civil War. And they'll be fighting around Petersburg throughout April 2nd. Um, and into the third, the Confederate Army will start to abandon Petersburg as well as Richmond. They'll start to pull out to the west. Um, and as they go west, they're going to go look for supplies um, towards Amelia Courthouse and eventually to a place called Appomattox. Now farther down to the south, we would have uh, actions taking place uh, that would be in the Carolinas. These actions in the Carolinas uh, would take place with William T. Sherman and his army group. Uh, this group will be moving from um, uh, eventually Atlanta, uh, as you can see here, down to Savannah, Georgia, on his famous March to the Sea. After Sherman uh, captures Savannah, he's then going to head north into the Carolinas. Uh, as he heads into the Carolinas, he'll, he'll capture the Confederate, cap I'm sorry, the 
Confederate capital of South Carolina, uh, Columbia, that's the state capital, and then eventually slip into North Carolina. And as he does so, um, he'll be engaging an old foe named Joe Johnston. Uh, Joe Johnston has come in and out of command throughout the entire Civil War from first Manassas now all the way up to the surrenders. And his armies, uh, Johnston's, will start to um, come around a place called Greensboro, North Carolina, about 70 miles to the west of Raleigh. And there, uh, Johnston and and Sherman will start uh, surrender negotiations uh, between the two men, but specifically at a place called Durham Station. Today we call it Durham, North Carolina. Uh, but Sherman had not had an easy march through the Carolinas. There are some battles, uh, specifically at places in North Carolina like Aversburg and Bentonville, uh, but uh, the writing is on the wall by, by early to mid-April 18, of 1865 that uh, Lee's army is on the ropes as well as Johnston's armies, and Grant and Sherman, the great one-two punch of the Union, uh, now have the Confederates on the ropes. So things look pretty dire at this point. And uh, as the Confederate Army crumbles around Petersburg and they start heading uh, westward, uh, Mr. Kolakowski, what's uh, going on in the mind of Robert E. Lee as he's fleeing Ulysses S. Grant there? The big thing is he's trying to get west. He's trying to, more importantly, get southwest to join up with Joe Johnston and take personal command of that army group. And remember, Lee has just become a general in chief of the Confederate armies a few weeks before. And uh, his objective is to get down there in North Carolina and try and fight it out, a desperate last stand, something like that. Um, in order to do that, he needs rations. And one of the big problems he has is there's a staff mix up at Amelia Courthouse where the promised rations are in fact not delivered. And so he, by waiting to forage, it allows, he had a head start on the federal army, but then he loses his lead. And through a very dint, a dint of very heavy marching, Grant from then on is continually able to, to continue to cut off that southern, that southern escape route down toward Danville, down toward the Carolinas, and ultimately at Appomattox we'll be able to get in front of Lee's army enough to stop him and surround the Army of Northern Virginia at that point. And and, uh, when, I was when say, he tries say, to break out on the morning of April 9th, um, you know, he realizes at that point, he says, I must go see General Grant and I would rather die a thousand deaths. Uh, we can see uh, Chris White there using the John Madden pen. I love uh, the reference there for uh, old time folks of uh, old time fans of football. Um, if I, Chris, uh, let me ask you to bring that um, previous map up just for a second. Um, and uh, Doug, as you're taking a look at the map, lots of different colors, lots of different arrows. Um, make a little sense of that map for me as we're taking a look at uh, all these twisting, uh, mm -hmm. twisting routes. Right. So as you remember, as uh, Chris White said earlier, Grant has, you know, what we would say in modern parlance is an army group. He's basically got the Army of the Potomac plus. So he's got the second, fifth, and sixth corps of the Army of the Potomac that we're all, we're all familiar with. And he also has the 18th corps. He also has the 24th corps under, Ed, under Edward O.C. Ord. And so he has you know, basically not just the core of the Army of the Potomac, but also these additional corps, and he's going to use them as well as the Ninth Corps to shuttle all of his troops to the West. So where you see where Chris has highlighted Sheridan and Griffin, you're looking at the cavalry under Phil Sheridan, as well as the Fifth Corps under Charles Griffin. Humphreys and Wright, that Humphreys represents the U.S. Second Corps, and Wright is commanding the Sixth Corps. And as he's moving West, they are trying to get, as a Chris mentioned, it's me and all these Chris's. Uh, as Kolakowski <laughs> mentioned, um, he's going to basically constantly trying to get in front of that army. And so he's basically going to fork that army at, in, at Jetersville and tr still trying to get around and in front of the Confederate army. That's why if you've been to the Sailor's Creek battlefield, it's an interesting battlefield to visit because the Confederates are essentially getting attacked from two sides. You've got the 6th Corps on the southern end of the battlefield and the 2nd Corps attacking the Confederates from the northern end of the battlefield, more or less. Um, uh, basically, that's what's happening here. We have these pincers trying to catch up and get in front of the Confederate Army, and you have Army Corps uh, that we're maybe not used to seeing, uh, seeing or thinking of working together, working together, where you have the 24th Corps and the 5th Corps on the same line of march with Sheridan's cavalry out to Appomattox Station. Uh, and you see John G. Park and the Ninth Corps uh, trying to be relevant there uh, in the bottom right of the screen. 
One of the things that as you follow the armies um, westward, uh, a lot of Civil War trails markers. Um, the Civil War trails has a, a fantastic driving tour that you can follow to kind of see some of the sites. Some great state battlefields through there. Um, so it's really a, a worthwhile way to spend a day and uh, even, even I would say, um, more than a day because you can kind of get lost as you get out there with so much stuff to see. Um, Chris, you had brought up another map a second ago and I'd uh, sort of redirected you there. So I, I'll let you get back on track. Unmute myself. Um, no, what what I was just uh, trying to show was the the Appomattox Courthouse battle there. But th this this is these campaign maps are fantastic. Edward Alexander uh, from Emerging Civil War put put this one together, and it, I think it's appropriate. It is Chris Kulikowski said, um, you know the 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 Confederates are trying to get to the south into the west. They're trying to get supplies first and foremost. They have to supply this army. Um, Richmond would be set ablaze, not by Union soldiers, but by Confederate soldiers burning, you know, great storehouses of the Confederacy. Um, if, you, if you look at the map that we have here, um, you'll see the name Yule, Richard Yule. He is not in command of the Confederate Second Corps, like most people would think. He was uh, really in charge of the Richmond defenses. He is now retreating to the south and to the west to hook up with Lee. Um, you'll see the names Longstreet, Mahone, Gordon, Cook. Fitzhugh Lee, Anderson. Um, so as you start to look at some of these names that, that Robert E. Lee is working with in uh, early 1865, you're not seeing the, the normals, the Stuarts, the Jacksons, and others because most of them have either been killed or wounded, knocked out of the war. Um, he does still have his old war horse, Longstreet, who is still his second in command um, as they're heading the march out towards Amelia Courthouse um, and then out towards uh, Sailor's Creek where we have a battle there um, in April 6th and then High Bridge and then eventually which will take us out to Appomattox Courthouse. So what you have here is a convergence of all the Confederate forces that Lee can bring to bear um, in the Richmond Petersburg area, anything that he can save and then heading out here towards the west. Um, but time and time again, Phil Sheridan's Cav have been uh, cutting off the, the Confederates. You know, the, they constantly have to pull their trains out before uh, they could be captured by Union, uh, Union horsemen. A lot of times they are captured by them. And that's what's eventually is going to, to end the battle or, or end this campaign, as well as this portion of the American Civil War. Once you get out to Appomattox Station, um, you're going to have that combined army group of John Gibbon with the 24th Corps of the Army of the James. Um, you have Charles Griffin's 5th Army Corps. You have Sheridan's Cavalry this is going to be a, a battle out here, um, which is not so much a battle, but a feeling action on the morning of April 9th of 1865. Um, and as we get farther along in the story, this is going to be really when the Confederates realize it's all up. Um, we're nearly surrounded. There's no way we're gonna get to Joe Johnston to the South, the next senior commander. He's down in North Carolina. Uh, by distance, it's not that far, but by having to trudge past all these armies and then eventually maybe run into William T. Sherman's army group, it's just too daunting of a journey for the Confederates. And a lot of people forget there was an actual battle at Appomattox Courthouse before the surrenders take place. Kind of a forgotten action, but uh, a key one because it's really Lee's last gasp. Um, the Appomattox battlefield is a little disorienting for folks who've not been there. Um, the direction, the, uh, the approach of the armies. Doug, I see you nodding your head. Why don't I have you speak to that a little bit? Well, yeah, I also think, you know, the park itself, um, the park itself focuses on the town, the historic uh, his, you know, Appomattox Courthouse town with the courthouse building and the McLean House and some of the other lands that the, the battlefield, as it were, is a little bit more difficult to access if you wanted to get, say, where Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain was when he makes his last advance. It's kind of hard to get out there, um, which kind of sort of prompted me nodding my head. But it's one of those uh, famous ironies of the Civil War in, the, in that the last attack of the army, uh, the Union Army, is coming up from the south as the Confederates are trying to make their way to this to the southwest. So, in, if you're looking at this map, you see them attacking uh, the Confederates moving down, uh, down in your screen. Uh, that is attacking south towards the oncoming Union troops who have now gotten around and in front of them and are attacking uh, in a northerly direction towards Appomattox Courthouse itself. 
So before this attack takes place, uh, Lee has a consultation that the evening before he realizes that uh, he's, he's getting run to ground and he talks with his commanders and they come to, I think, a, a very important decision about whether they should try to fight it out, whether they should surrender, whether they should disperse and go into the mountains. Um, what, what was the, the import of that discussion and, and the result of, of Lee's final decision there? Uh, Mr. Kulikowski, let me have you talk about that for a second. Well, and I want to add another element to this discussion as well, because the night of April 8th is when Grant and Lee start exchanging messages across the line to discuss the possibility of the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, Grant has already proposed a general peace, and Lee says, I can't, you know, he's, he's starting that exchange of, I can't, I can't uh, treat on the subject of peace, but if you want, we can talk about other, you know, talk about the surrender of my forces. That discussion is starting in Lee's mind already. And he has a council of war with his generals. And there are several of the younger officers that want to disperse the army and go and fight in the hills. Take literally take to the hills and, and go fight as isolated guerrilla units. And uh, Lee, there are several others that, that, that back him up. But Lee is the, the real voice that's, that basically tells him, he, he plays it off as a joke. He says, I'm too old to go bushwhacking. But the big thing, the big thing that he says is, if we do that, this war is going to be prolonged. It's going to deepen the hatred between the sessions. He understands something that both Grant and Grant understands as well, and that that other U.S. Army officers that have ended wars, like Douglas MacArthur, Norman Schwarzkopf, for example, understand is that the end of the war is the beginning of the peace. And he knows, he knows when he leaves Richmond, he he takes a per, he takes one pristine uniform with him. He doesn't know he's going to be back in a week, but he knows he's going to need it for something. And I will let you interpret that something as to what it is. But he knows he's going to need it, need to present himself, you know, perfectly as commander in chief of the Confederate Armed Forces at some point. So this is, I don't want to get too much too, you know, too psychological on that. But the thing is, he's known in the back of his head that, that the odds are long. And at the end of the war is far closer than the beginning. But I think he realizes that, that. What's that? As I think he's known that for a year. I think I think as soon as as soon as he has to withdraw to Spotsylvania, I think Robert E. Lee knows that the clock is running. It's just a matter of time. I think it's. I think he's known that for a long time. We can debate that. We can debate that over some beer sometime, Doug. <laughs> uh, but the the, the the fact of the matter is, is by April eighth, he knows this is just about finished. And his, his mind has to turn now to what role do I play in ending the war, but also beginning the peace and setting that on the right foot. And so it's in the middle of all of this that he starts the, you know, Grant sends his first message across and they start exchanging messages. And then Lee has this discussion and Lee is already looking ahead to trying to reunite the country. And he, you know, he'll, he'll say a couple of days later, he says, you know, they, they're our countrymen again. Actually, Grant will say that. That's my mistake. But Lee would agree with that sentiment. He says the, the reunification is going to start here. And what we do is going to set the tone for the rest of the Confederacy. He knows his value to the Confederacy is a symbol. He knows that he, many people in the South regard him as the second coming of George Washington, with all that that means. And the political and a role that the Army of Northern Virginia plays just in the ethos of the Confederacy. He recognizes all that. He recognizes that what he does is going to be decisive. And so he tells his team, don't do it. We're not going to, we're not going to break apart because that's, that is going to create all kinds of problems and is going to make this a longer and harder post-war period than we want. As much as we want to keep fighting, you know, we, we know this is that that's not a good course of action. We have to stick together and uh, it, rise or fall as an army, not as a isolated group of bushwhack, isolated bands of bushwhackers. One of the things I think that's really important about that moment is, uh, you know, Lee said, hey, we, we decided we were going to try to decide this question on the battlefield and we've lost. And so right. we're going to stick with that decision and the parameters that that imposes upon us um, because, you know, we're not going to take our ball and go home, you know, and, and rewrite the rules and be, you know, like 
This is what mm-hmm. we signed on for, and this is what it's going to be. Right. Chris, uh, Chris White, let me ask you, um, these powers, a symbol, setting a tone. Grant's also thinking about setting a tone in this moment. Um, tell me your take on, on that tone setting that's going on here. Well, I, I think what, what Chris Kolakowski is getting to is an important point with uh, Lee not wanting to go into this, uh, you know, small warfare, le petit guerre. Um, this is really the antithesis of what the Confederacy in 1861 was all about. You have to look backwards in time at this point. Um, many of the Confederacy, um, after they, they've declared their independence, uh, many of the politicians and many of the generals um, were what we would consider cooperationists. That is not that they want to cooperate with the Union at all. They want to cooperate with one another in the Deep South. They want to be of one mind. They want to be of one, um, you know, united front. Because if you do that, then you're going to show Europe and other powers that we are a legitimate power to be reckoned with. We are a country. Um, Come negotiate with us. Be our friends, you know, and and trade with us and potentially support this this war. Um, So once you start looking at uh, going into guerrilla warfare, a la, you know, the Spanish ulcer of Napoleon um, in the 18, 18 teens, you're, you're going to the antithesis of that. What you're now showing is we can't hold on anymore. Um, and Europe had, had already, you know, largely checked out on the Confederacy years ago because, you know, the Confederates were outmaneuvered, especially Jefferson Davis was outmaneuvered by Abraham Lincoln at every turn. Um, the Confederate Congress was largely a, a, a you know, useless body uh, for, for whenever it came to actually overseeing the government of, of the Confederacy or helping helping to govern. Davis at times was, was, his hands were tied as he's dealing with people like Zebulon Vance and Joe Brown, the governors of North Carolina and Georgia respectively. So what you're, what you're seeing is Lee also taking it from the battlefield and taking it on to the political front. Um, you know, and the difference between Spain uh, and Napoleon and Robert E. Lee in 1865 would be the fact that uh, Napoleon was more worried about going east in Europe. Now, with Sherman coming from the south and, uh, and Grant coming down from the east and from the north, he can surround this pocket of Confederates if they melt into, into the countryside. And also the fact that in 1865, it, it is very difficult to coordinate any sort of guerrilla movements in, in these countryside. So that, that's a big problem that you're going to deal with. Um, in now, to, to your other point with them looking towards the next step, um, I, I don't think Lee thought that this war was over at Spotsylvania Courthouse. I know he knows it was over once Lincoln was reelected. At that point, that, it's just the, the run down the clock. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. I'm sorry? I, I would agree with you on that. If, if he thought the war was over at Spotsylvania, he wouldn't have been raging at North Anna. We must strike them a blow. We can't let them pass again. He still has a hope of victory until Lincoln is reelected. And then after that, you're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And, and with Lincoln, you, you have someone who had been politically maneuvering the entire war uh, from the Fort Sumter crisis all the way up through. And Gettysburg Address is the, the perfect example of this is what we're looking at in the future. This is what we're going to do with this country together once we bring it back together. So what, once you have Robert E. Lee here in this corner, Lee doesn't want to make this war, you know, he doesn't want to keep dragging out this war. He sees that the writing is on the wall. So will Joe Johnson, as we talk about him in a few minutes at Bennett Place. Um, um, Grant, on the other side, you know, had been told by Lincoln to, you know, to essentially let him up easy. In February of 1865, uh, David Dixon Porter, William T. Sherman, Ulysses S. Grant, they're going to meet with uh, Lincoln. I'm sorry, March of 1865, they're going to meet with Lincoln. Um, and they're going to talk about uh, what to do. You know, how do we start to handle this? Because they can see the writing on the wall, too. Lincoln knows he has to bring the Confederacy back into the fold. Um, he does not want to make this as, as painful as humanly possible, like radical Republicans do. He wants to bring them back in. He wants to make sure what this war was fought over, specifically, which will be taken care of by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and that will be the freedom of slaves and then eventually their citizenship and their voting rights. He wants to make sure that those are solidified, those, those things, and then we can work on how are we going to govern this nation again. So, so Grant is really taking his cues from Lincoln, um, you know, during this time. And, and Lee, uh, in a way, is almost taking his own cues because it almost seems like Davis wants to keep this thing going far beyond the point of no return. Yeah, the fact that, that Davis flees out of Richmond 
takes as much of the Confederate government as he can, hops a train, heads down to North Carolina, trying to eventually get to Georgia, get to Florida, get out of the country and try to rally support um, almost to the point where everybody around him starts looking at him like he has lost his mind. Um, and as we can talk about when we get down to a Bennett place, uh, John Breckinridge basically disobeys orders and starts negotiating for peace, even though Davis specifically told him not to, because Davis is really clinging to this. I love your point about Lincoln outmaneuvering him politically at every turn. And I think, uh, you know, there's a topic for another discussion, but I think Lincoln's real superpower and, and one reason why he's so misunderstood by his contemporaries is that he has the, the ability to see that 50,000 foot view and to look forward in a way that other people don't. And as a result, he's got 3D chess going while most people are playing checkers. And I think that that really allows him to outplay and outmaneuver so many folks. And, and Lee and Johnston also know that the longer they drag this out after it's, it's well past its deadline, um, the worse it's going to be. The radical Republicans are now in charge of things in, in the North. This is prior to Lincoln's assassination. Um, so so they, they don't know how bad it could potentially get. Um, you know, obviously we're looking back 150 odd years ourselves, but you know, the longer they drag this out, the uglier it could be for the South. The reparations could be, you know, uh, something along the lines of the allies after the first world war, taking it out on Germany and Austria, Hungary. And, and let's, let's not forget the recent, some of the recent examples from Europe that might be in that that might be informing some of these perspectives. What they've been seeing in the headlines, yeah, the 1863-64 Polish uh, attempted war of independence, and what's happened to what's happened to the losers there? They've all been, most of them have gone to Siberia or have been dispossessed or worse. And and you know it's set back set back the Polish people for a, for a generation for sure. Um, and you had families that were nobility in one generation, and then all of a sudden, by the early 20th century, are penniless immigrants to the United States from Poland. Why? They backed the independence movement. You also have the Schleswig-Holstein War, um, the punitive peace that the Prussians imposed on the on the uh, the Danes and the coalition up there. And of course, they're getting ready for another round against uh, Austria in 1866. Um, and you've got, uh, of course, the example of the 48ers, you know, all those failed revolutions and all those failed um, efforts, you know, and how many of them end up in the Union Army and some of them end up in the Confederate Army, you know. And so this whole idea of let them up easy is actually not, it's not that common in world history. There's not a tremendous amount of examples of it. No, absolutely not. And so you, when you look at this, that's a factor in Lincoln's mind, that's a, but that's a factor in the Confederates' mind. You're absolutely right. If this goes much longer, by the way, the planting season as well coming up, if this goes much longer, you know, might they march, you know, I mean, Lee is legitimately concerned at Appomattox that his army is going to march off to prison and that he is going to get hung in Washington. He is, and when Grant says what he says about, no, we're going to give him a parole and everything, you know, all the accounts say at that moment, Lee visibly relaxed. You know, and Joe Johnston, when, uh, you know, when we're, he gets word, when Sherman tells him that Lincoln's been shot and been killed, you know, Johnston gets, goes pale. Yeah. Because <laughs> he's, what, what does this mean? And, you know, does this mean I'm going to go hang in front of the White House? You know, do, what does, what does this mean? So there's a, that's a legitimate concern on the part of the Confederates. And you're right, they need to manage it. And that's something that they, they can't take their eye off of that ball. Yeah, and there are some great recent studies uh, of Europe looking from the 1750s all the way up through the 1870s, looking at a lot of these uh, revolutions, if you will, some are revolutions, some are not. Um, and, and as Chris Kolakowski pointed out, it doesn't go well for, for many of them. You know, this is, this could go, uh, this could legitimately, they could line them up against the wall if they wanted to, if Lincoln wanted to, he, and have them shot for high treason, and he'd be well within the constitutional rights to do so. Um, so I said that, I think that says a lot about Lincoln, Grant, and others, and especially Sherman, you know, people, Sherman gets a bad rap, and we'll talk about him in a few minutes. Uh, but Sherman, as soon as the, 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 he flips that switch from warfare to peace, you know, he, he goes, it's, it's it's a 180. Uh, he's two different people. 
Yeah, he was all in, you know, like war is going to be as horrible as we can make it so that we can get to peace sooner. And once peace comes, you said it's a, it's a flip switch. Doug, I want to bring you back in here for just a second. Yeah. Um, we're kind of creeping toward Bennett Place. We've been talking about the uh, Lincoln assassination and, and Joe Johnson and Sherman, but I, I don't want to leave Appomattox without talking about Grant for a second. Um, put me in Grant's shoes at Appomattox uh, on the morning of the 9th and, and, and his final important choices that he has to make there. Well, I think Grant, um, like you guys are saying, he's, he sees, you know, the, the next movement is the, is to bring on the peace. That conversation he's had with Lincoln and with, and with Porter and Sherman is very much on his mind. Um, he, he is not wanting to march these guys off to prison or have them lined up and shot. I mean, he, these are people that know him, people that he knows. This is, you know, the, the man doesn't even like the sight of blood. He wants to end this war peacefully and he wants to do it with dignity and I think his first his first order of business is to make sure that those things are going to be taken care of that this this army can go back to its homes uh where they can start like you guys said but planting season is coming and go back to their farms and start just rebuilding he grant of all people knows what this war has done to the countryside um they want to make sure he wants to make sure that this ends peaceably so that so that this next phase in American history can come about I think it's I think that's what What's, in, what's foremost on his mind is stopping the bloodshed as quickly as possible and getting this this peace train moving, so to speak. And I think because he's so magnanimous um, and, and things go so smoothly, that sets the tone for um, how a lot of other surrenders could go, although they don't necessarily. But I think that's also why we remember it as the surrender, because it's so neat, it's so tidy, it's so civil, things go so smoothly. And uh, so it, it has a very powerful symbolic uh, role in our national memory as a result of that. I, I also You've got the two greatest general, you know, the two most famous generals on each side. The other big thing is this is the only major surrender where the troops are actually in contact with each other. You know, if you yeah. look at the other surrenders, particularly Bennett Place, which is the largest of the Confederate forces to surrender, Sherman's army is around Raleigh and Johnston's army is at Greensboro. Most Confederates don't see a Union soldier at the time of surrender. You know, and so there's this, you've got them surrounded and, you know, there's this forced proximity that requires, I don't know if more theater is quite the word, but it requires more process and it requires more issues that need to be addressed um, from, you know, issuing of paroles, stacking arms, you know, congratulatory orders, things like that. Because it's all cheek by jowl, it has to be a more formal process. It sets the tone for the rest of the, I mean, everybody else uses Appomattox as the precedent for the other armies to surrender as the dominoes fall. But at the same time, Appomattox, because the troops are right there, right next, you know, literally within, within uh, rifle range of each other, it requires that formality. Well, and I also think, you know, let's not confuse Grant's magnanimity for, for simplicity. He, he, he wants to let him up easy, as the president said, but he also wants to make sure that not only Lee, but more importantly, Lee's armies know that this war is over for them. And the symbolism of them stacking arms, laying down their weapons, getting the paperwork for the paroles, and then being told to go home is going to make it very clear to especially those young officers who might think, well, Lee's not in charge anymore. Let's take my brigade up into the hills. No, 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 son, your war is over. Your men are going home and it's done. And I think Grant very much wants to drive that point home. It is over for you guys. We'll be nice about it, but you're done. <laughs> no, and, and that's, a, that's a perfectly valid yeah. um, example yeah. there because it, it could happen and that has to be a worry uh, on both Lee's mind as well as Grant's mind. I mean, Grant on the morning of, of April 9th is said to have had a horrible migraine. Um, his worry really is still, um, even though we're looking back 150 some odd years, it, it, he has to be worried that Lee's going to slip away yet again. Um, you know, he's done it before, you know, potentially does he, does he get farther to the West? Does he get to the South? Does he get with Joe Johnson? How long is it going to take to end this war? So once, uh, you know, that they decide that they're going to meet at two o'clock PM at, in Wilmer McLean's parlor, um, you know, in Appomattox courthouse, you know, Grant really has to, he can finally give that sigh of relief. 
And uh, of course, news gets up to Lincoln pretty quickly. Um, he had originally been invited to go to Charleston, South Carolina. Here's where I'm going to tie Doug's hat in. Um, he was supposed to go to a flag raising ceremony at Fort Sumter scheduled for the morning of April 14th. That would have been the anniversary of when the flag was taken down after uh, Confederates first fired on Fort Sumter. Um, Lincoln was supposed to be there, but because things were kind of developing so quickly with Grant chasing after Lee, he stays home. And so Robert Anderson, who'd been a major at the time he had surrendered the fort or, or walked away from the fort, he didn't actually foremost surrender. Uh, when he walked away from the fort, uh, he comes back as a major general to raise that same flag. And uh, in Washington, there's lots of exultation. And then of course, that evening, the flag raising ceremony gets totally overshadowed by events at Ford Theater and uh, the one shot that uh, changes the course of the war uh, inexorably. How does that impact the surrenders that then follow that news? Chris? Chris White? <laughs> well, well, let's finish Appomattox very quickly. Um, at Appomattox, April 9th, 1865, Lee and Grant come together. Um, they're going to sit down in, in, in the parlor of Wilmer McLean. I'll show you that picture, uh, artist rendition here. Um, he, and he, the, the two sit down to, to talk about the terms. And, and the terms are going to be very simple. Um, that, as Doug pointed out, the, the enlisted men have to march out, uh, further color, surrender those, and then stack their arms. Um, the, the officers are allowed to keep their personal baggage, um, which you had to be very careful about how you presented what personal baggage actually was. This will be a problem at Bennett Place we'll talk about. Um, you also have to, he's also going to allow them to keep their horses, uh, and he's also going to allow them to keep their sidearms and, and head home. They're also going to be given a parole slip, and this parole slip is actually very, very key because the parole slip is really worth its weight in gold. So the Confederates with this parole slip are able to uh, go and um, get on a federal train for free. Any of the federal train systems uh, throughout the war, the Union Army has been rebuilding Confederate railroads in the South and using them for the United States Military Railroad. They're also able to draw rations with these, uh, with this parole slip. So the parole slip isn't just so much a formality of here you're paroled, you cannot um, take up arms against the United States again. It's also their ticket home. It's also their meal ticket in a way so until they get Get back to their homes and their farms. And eventually you'll have the, the surrender ceremonies, um, which will be made famous, you know, with um, probably the, the most famous one will be uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain talking about uh, accepting the surrenders. Uh, this, this painting shows James Longstreet, uh, the first Corps commander, marching up with his army in Northern Virginia battle flag. And um, they're coming up to, to surrender the arms here. They would they would halt, front, go into a battle line, and then sack their arms, move on. Next brigade would come up, the next division, the next corps would, would come along um, after these the, the surrenders here um, at Appomattox Courthouse. So, um, you know, like Doug said, this is, this is formal. They have to show that this is happening. So now uh, here at Appomattox Courthouse, April 9th, the, the, the two sides have signed the surrender. On April 12th, the two sides will get together, uh, and they will start to formally turn over those arms and men will start to go home from Lee's army. So then we'll jump ahead then to Joe Johnson and uh, things there unfold um, with a, a similar degree of, of um, civility, but uh, not nearly as neat and tidy. Um, Mr. Kolakowski, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about why those two surrenders are so different? Well, the big thing is, one of the big reasons is actually Lincoln's assassination. To your question earlier, how does that impact further surrenders? Um, <clears throat> Sherman is very concerned when he gets the word. Um, you know, who was, what's this new president going to be? Johnson, you know, all this other, you know, what's, what's the policy going to be in Congress? You know, what's the new political landscape? And he's anxious to get this done. And he tells Johnston, as we talked about, Johnston gets very pale. But both of them realize that let's try and get something generally done because Johnson's got elements of the Confederate government with him. In fact, uh, John Breckinridge, who's a general and also the secretary of war for the Confederate government will join the negotiations um, in the second round. And what they'll do is they'll basically come up with a general peace and Johnston will surrender all of his forces and basically set an agreement that would then be other forces in Alabama and, and the trans Mississippi would be able to then use to surrender. And basically, they take it back to Jeff Davis, and Jeff Davis says, great. They take it to Andrew Johnson, and Johnson says, you've gone way too far. 
We are not treating on a general piece. You've gotten way too political questions. That's reserved for the presidency. So just go back and get, get, a, get a field surrender a la Appomattox. In fact, Grant has to go down and talk to Sherman and take that message because the North tells you how fast public opinion has turned is because after Lincoln, there's a thirst for revenge against the South. And there are a lot of Northern newspapers that are going after Sherman and say, look at you, you're, going, you're too friendly to the South, all this other stuff. They just murdered our president, you know, all this stuff. And that's the contemporary, I'm not saying that's a correct view, but I'm saying that's the current, that's the contemporary public opinion in late, late April, 1865 in the North. And so well, Sherman think- bears the brunt of this. And so he has to go back and they have to recut the deal on the 26th of April, 1865, and basically make it a military surrender of all forces in the Carolinas, Georgia, Florida, um, that are under Joe Johnston's command. And that's what they end up doing. Doug, you were going to add something in there? Well, you know, I think, you know, I, I paged through some stuff, some stuff before we get in on the, on the talk today, you know, they, everyone who was in and around uh, Raleigh, all the, all the union, all the union accounts that I looked at, everyone mentions the death of Lincoln. The death of Lincoln is foremost on their mind. And when does Sherman get the news of Lincoln's death? the morning he's supposed to meet with Joe Johnston. Mm-hmm. So I think, uh, you know, every, and all these accounts are like, woe unto, you know, John Geary says, woe unto, the, unto rebeldom if we fight this war anymore. If the war goes on after Lincoln has been killed, he knows, and, he, and all of, and, and uh, uh, Alpheus Williams is in agreement. When do those two guys ever agree? Um, they're in agreement that if this war goes on, it's gonna be bad for the South, that Joe Johnston is afraid of what's gonna to happen to North Carolina if news of Lincoln's assassination gets out. So I think, you know, part of the reason Sherman is definitely going above his pay grade here is that he wants to make it clear not only to the Confederates, but also to his own people, that this is what is expected of you in, the, in, this, in this new reality without the president, is that we are not gonna go start looting North Carolina, start pillaging the, the Confederates, start committing all sort of depredations as revenge for Lincoln's death. I want my guys to be absolutely clear, this is what we are going to do. This is how we're going to respond to this, rather than let all hell break loose and let that revenge spirit infect his army, which has already had quite a bit of experience of screwing things up. And I think it's a shame that he gets his wrist slapped so bad um, by Washington for overstepping his bonds. And he certainly does go in over his head. But if you look at his original terms, um, they're very magnanimous. Um, and, and for all of the criticism that Sherman gets in, in history and memory, um, as being so cruel and evil and awful to the South, he was really trying to extend uh, an olive branch and, and do a good turn by the South with those initial terms. Um, and then Grant gets sent down to kind of, all right, look, let's kind of straighten this out and, and change things around here. Um, and I think that that's uh, unfortunate for Sherman. Yeah, and what you're dealing with too is the- earlier, uh, I think Sherman would have been much better, you know, he wouldn't have gone through that excori- <laughs> excuse me, excoriation. Uh, but once Lincoln's assassination and the winds start blowing differently, um, it's, I mean, it's a tricky situation uh, for sure. Yeah, so, and what you're dealing with in Washington is, is the fact that you have a president who's now two days into office and his, his cabinet or his, his predecessor's cabinet is starting to run amok somewhat. Um, Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War, you know, he's dead against what, what Sherman's up to. Uh, he's actually going to order uh, Henry Halleck to uh, issue orders to, you know, to relieve Sherman and send Grant down that way to, to take care of things. Grant is definitely reluctant to do so. Sherman's just fuming. He's utterly fuming. Um, so there's an account of him meeting with his corps commanders and his army commanders and him not talking to anybody, but just talking in general, stomping back and forth, uh, basically bad mouthing, not only the current administration, as well as all the New York papers. Um, you know, it got so bad at one point during the Carolina campaign that something poor was written about Sherman and uh, some men from the 20th Army Corps went out and burned a bunch of the New York Tribune papers. Um, they went out there and just burned them. And, and you're also starting to deal with the problem that Raleigh is the capital of uh, South Car- or, sorry, of North Carolina. And uh, troops are now thinking about taking their revenge out on Columbia. Um, you know, that, that is the idea that we're just going to burn this place to the ground because of what they've done to Lincoln. And then you come back to the problem with what Sherman had said. You know, the real core of the problem 
was that neither Johnston nor Sherman are lawyers. Uh, they're both West Point graduates, um, and they, become, they come to respect each other very well during these negotiations. They really don't know each other prior to this, but they become good friends after this. So they bring in John, uh, John Breckinridge, to, who is the Secretary of War uh, for the Confederacy at one point. He's also the Vice President of the United States under James Buchanan. Um, he, he's a Confederate general. You know, he's been all over the place. And um, Breckinridge is brought in specifically because he, he's a lawyer. And that, that's a way to, to look at uh, the, these, tr these treatments. So on April 17th, you have the first of these surrender terms being talked about between Sherman and Johnston. And that is just the Lincoln assassinations fresh in their mind. And what comes to the fore and what really worries the radical Republicans is the terminology of personal property, that these Confederates can go back to their personal property as well as go back to their state governments and potentially just take up their old roles antebellum. So you have these two, two major issues that the radical Republicans are saying, whoa, 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 we just fought this war. We just ended slavery. We're going to have this 13th Amendment here. We can't go back on this. We're going to be back to status quo antebellum or back to square one. So, you know, somebody's got to, to rein in William T. Sherman. And of course, things get, uh, um, you know, takes several days for those negotiations to go through. When Breckinridge is brought in, uh, Sherman specifically says, you're here as a general, not as a politician, because we don't want to recognize the Confederate government. Um, that would be a problem. And so let's just kind of keep this among. Uh, among I, do, I do want to do want to throw something out that's more of a question than anything that I that, that just kind of occurred to me in the course of this discussion. We always talk about the Lincoln assassination as a turning point, which it is, and it, how it inflamed the North. But it wasn't just Lincoln that was the target. Johnson, Seward, several other cabinet officers. I mean, it was an attempt to decapitate the United States government. I just want to build off that because I because this is from Alpheus Williams letter to his daughter on April 21st. He says the reported assassination at Mr. Seward's would seem to indicate a most nefarious widespread plot. It is hoped that it will not turn out so. Basically, the idea like even Alpheus Williams is afraid that this is going to be this is not just an isolated madman striking down the president, but that it is a wider plot and that the Confederate government is implicated in it. So sure. I think that's also part of it as well. And that, uh, to my mind, that would have to feed, feed whatever whatever storm is blow, is blowing a public opinion is blowing in the north. Yeah, and this is the knife that they uh, literally try to decapitate one of the members with, and that's uh, Seward. This is uh, Lewis Payne or Lewis Powell whenever he broke into uh, Secretary of State uh, William Seward's house and uh, tried to kill him. Um, this is the knife he actually used. It's out in the Huntington Library in uh, California today. So Johnson ends up surrendering more than 89,000 men. Um, we compare that to about 28,000 men that Lee has surrendered. So by far, Johnson's got the largest surrender, but there are still other surrenders that take place. I know we've got maybe five minutes left, so we can't really get into them in details. But uh, as we look at how the rest of the Confederacy, Confederacy surrenders, um, what sort of sense are you guys able to make about those dominoes as they fall? I think domino falling is a perfect example of that. Once you once you take the two main Confederate armies off the board, not to mention the commander in chief of the Confederate Armed Forces off the board, Robert E. Lee, the rest, you know, they. What's the point? You know, we're just just going to follow suit. The one exception to that, though, is the Trans Mississippi, which had enough resources economically to hold out longer. And there's some evidence that that Kirby Edmund Kirby Smith and some of his people wanted to do that. But with the Mexican, the war in Mexico with the French and Maximilian getting really, really interesting at that point, um, the Federals induced them to surrender. In fact, Simon Bolivar Buckner in some ways cuts the surrender deal behind Kirby Smith's back in New Orleans um, at, at the end of May and early June of 1865. And, uh, you know, and Smith finally just like, okay, fine. You know, he was trying to, he was trying to keep something going. Um, he was something of a bitter ender himself, just like Jeff Davis. But, uh, you know, with Davis by that time captured, with everybody else gone, and, you know, really, do you really, do you want to keep fighting what, what will, because the, the mass of the United States will turn on you. And so, you know, but Buckner, Buckner's a key cog in that whole negotiation and, and the Trans-Mississippi. And then, of course, there's this, the CSS Shenandoah, halfway around the world, doesn't get the news until early August in the Pacific, 
they are days away from launching an attack on San Francisco. Think about that if they hadn't captured, you know, if they hadn't gotten their hands on those newspapers that informed them of the surrender of Lee and the capture of Jeff Day, all this stuff, and that the war's over. Could you imagine the war being over and then all of a sudden you get a word on the telegraph in mid-August 1865 that a Confederate ship has, has sailed into Golden Gate and has bombarded San Francisco and held it for ransom? That's crazy. <laughs> think, of what that would have, think of what that would have done to the country. Yeah. So they say, you know, they end up coming around and, and it's actually the last Confederate force to surrender on the planet when they haul down the flag in Liverpool Harbor and turn over the ship to the Royal Navy um, in 1865. Um, and November 6th, 1865, to be, to be precise. And then the uh, Royal Navy then turns the Shenandoah over to the United States. Um, so that's – dominoes falling, Chris, is, is a good way to look at it. Because what happens on the East Coast between Johnston, um, you know, the Johnston Army, the Lee Army before that, um, it, those dominoes falling, the others just kind of follow suit. It's just the details may be a little bit different, but they all – ultimately follow when Lee and Johnston go, go off the board. That's that. Yeah. And, and Lee and Jay and Johnson are the two um, senior commanders in the field. So once your two senior commanders go down in the field, that, that's what you're going to have. And, and essentially once Sherman's wrist is slapped, as it were, um, you know, he's going to give Johnston those uh, same surrender terms that Lee received at Appomattox courthouse. So it'll be the parole, personal property, or personal sidearms and horses can be kept by the, the officers. It's the stacking of the arms, which is done as Chris Kolakowski pointed out, you know, largely without union troops there. This will be done over in Greens, uh, High Point and Greensboro and other places, you know, nearly 70 miles away from Durham Station, which is today modern Durham, North Carolina, where the surrender actually took place. So I'll give a little plug to uh, one of our emerging Civil War books. This is To the Bitter End by Bert Dunkerley, and it traces out uh, not only the stories at Appomattox and at Bennett Place, but then talks about uh, Richard Taylor's surrender um, in Citronelle, Alabama, and the surrender in Arkansas, um, uh, Buckner's surrender on, on uh, June 2nd in Galveston, Stan Waddy, the, the Shenandoah, all these other stories that we've sort of talked about. And, and the surrender of the Confederacy gets less and less neat and tidy as these armies have to sort of figure out what to do for themselves and, and look out for themselves. Um, I also want to mention there's been a series that we've had um, this April on Emerging Civil War called Ending the War, a number of blog posts that talk about a whole bunch of different components of the different surrenders. Um, so I invite you to check that out at our blog, Emerging Civil War, www.emergingcivilwar.com. And uh, lots of links there, lots of great stuff to read. So gentlemen, um, to wrap things up, let me ask each of you to just sort of talk about um, what are your thoughts as uh, today, 155 years later, we're looking back at the surrender of the Confederacy. Um, what sort of things should today's Civil War buff consider? I think the, the number one is that Appomattox Courthouse, the war didn't end there. I, I think that's what most people assume. Right then and there, Appomattox Courthouse, Robert E. Lee, he's off the board. It's all over. Uh, but, it, you know, as we pointed out, this is going to drag on for the rest of the year, uh, be it field armies or ships that are going to be surrendering throughout. Um, you know, and, and another thing that always has stuck out to me is the fact that people always say, oh, they should have went with this guerrilla warfare. And, you know, I, I, I do believe that it would have only made it worse for the Southern Confederacy. I think that Johnston, Lee, Grant, Lincoln, um, I think they all made the right choices at the time. You know, it, it's very, very easy to sit back and quarterback these, this from afar. Uh, but they had a lot to deal with. This is not only that the t country was torn apart. They now have to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. They have to deal with the fact that the Southern economy has been ravaged, um, not only because of the warfare, but by the fact that the, the three and a half million slaves are now and forever free, um, you know, whenever you have a, a, a slave-based agrarian economy. So we have a lot of problems that we're dealing with here, and social discord is not something that you want to deal with, as well as, as guerrilla warfare. Um, you know, as the years go on, you know, the stories of these surrenders will, will be, you know, told time and time again, and, and you know, they'll be put up on pedestals and different things. And I think the, the, the way that they're interpreted today um, reminds me a lot of the ways that the German Imperial Army after 1918 
puts the blame on other people. They never take the blame themselves. They blame the politicians. They blame these people. They blame those people. I think it, there's a lot of correlation between the First World War, how it ended, and some of the some of the propaganda coming out of the, the losing army and the same thing that happened with the Confederate army. Um, I, so you have to cut through the propaganda on each side uh, to kind of find where the middle ground was and to understand that, that Lee, Johnston, Sherman, Lincoln, and Grant all tried to make these decisions for the betterment of both North and the South as they were coming back together as the United States. Great. Mr. Ullman. I think, you know, what I think for me, the biggest takeaway is that symbols matter. We remember Appomattox because they made a point of making sure that it was remembered. You know, you can say all you want about what, you know, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain or John Gordon wrote about the surrender ceremony and whether or not it's all 100% accurate. But the fact is, we know a surrender ceremony took place and everyone who was there remembers it and made a point of writing about it. That's why we have the passing of the armies. That's why it is so well. I mean, look at the, look at the, the, the slides that Chris White showed during this presentation. We had how many different iterations of surrenders at Appomattox compared to how many of Bennett Place. And even if he doesn't have a representative sample, it's still pretty close. It was what, four to one? Even if it's three to one, the amount of uh, symbolism that, that Appomattox has in American memory is what makes people think that that's where the war ended. Um, and not for nothing, it is the magnanimity of U.S. Grant and the, and the way that that is portrayed in the symbolism of the event you know, that you do have some kind of gesture on the part of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain sal saluting the Confederates or whatever it is to show the, to show the magnanimity of the Union forces. That, that, that display helped set the tone in that, at least in that part of the, that part of the war. And I think the lack of that symbolism in, you know, in uh, North Carolina might play a role in, 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 re in why we don't remember it and why um, that, that, that part of the war just seems a little bit uh, foreign to us because there isn't that nice, beautiful ending tableau that make us so, see that the war is over there. And uh, Chris here is showing us the, uh, some pictures from the dedication of the Unity Monument at, uh, at Bennett Place. Um, quite a crowd there though. <laughs> nice, nice <job. laughs> uh, Mr. Kolakowski. The United States was founded in July 1776, but I would argue that it was refounded in March and April of 18 and May and May of 1865. If you really look at what the United what the United States is, the relationship between the federal government and the states, many of the big issues that were result that were left unresolved in the uh, 1776 and the Constitutional Convention of 1787. Uh, many of those were resolved on the battlefield or were tilted. The debates were tilted by what happened on the battlefield and the Civil War and its immediate aftermath, of which the conditions for reconstruction, the conditions of the aftermath were set in those months. Lincoln issues the manifesto of what the new nation will be um, in the second inaugural. Lee, General Orders Number 9, April 10th, 1865, sets a manifesto to his soldiers of how they should regard what they have done for the last four or five years of their lives, which in turn is, expands further into that section. Um, this, in many ways, the, the union that we live in today, 155 years later, has its start in the spring of 1865. And I would commend that to people as they think about the, the nation. And we still have that political tension even today where there are people that say, is it the vision of 1776 for the United States in 1787? or is it the vision of 1865? And you can find a lot of the political debates in this country today coming back in some way, shape or form to those two visions that have met on the battlefield and are still with us today. Are we a continental? Are we a hemispheric nation? Are we a world power? Or should we be more insular? Should we avoid entangling alliances? Are we more agrarian? Are we more industrial? Are we more urban? All of that, goes back to 1865 and uh, has been, those debates have been tilted by what happened in 1865. All of them go back to 1776, but all of those have been influenced and have been reframed and continue to be framed by what happened in 1865. Very good. And so we always need to remember this period. 
it is it is important. You accept that the the Civil War defined the United States, which most people say without really thinking about it. Here is the definition, writing on the wall right here. The way the war ends also sets the conditions for the peace, starts Reconstruction, and how all that plays out continues to echo into the United States that we live in today. Very good. Gentlemen, I want to thank you all for your time today. We could go on and on, I'm sure. Uh, lots to talk about, lots of very complicated uh, issues. Um, the neat tidiness of Appomattox, I think, does a disservice to just how complicated this period of the war was and what its ramifications are for today. So certainly worth a lot of uh, extra study and examination. I want to thank my heterosexual life mate, Chris White, from the American Battlefield Trust. Uh, thank you for pulling all of this together and hosting us this evening, Mr. White. I want to thank Doug Allman, also formerly with the Trust, all-around great guy and contributor to Emerging Civil War, and my Polish brother, Chris Kolakowski, Chief historian at Emerging Civil War. I'm Chris Mikowski. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, and we will see you online and on the battlefield.